All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and, hist and historian. So it is Saturday, September 4th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well today. So I wanted to come on and and uh, talk for a few minutes about a uh, new 10 week online course that I teach on Saturdays uh, that deals with history from uh, 1865, the last year of the Civil War, 1865 through 1968. Okay, and we teach this class on Saturdays. And uh, normally it's uh, we do the class Saturdays, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, it's a 10 week online course. Uh, for today's class, we're going to start at 4 p.m. And uh, we do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch them over and over again. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have uh, book references, articles, video clips, etc. I'm going to post the link here. You can register for the online course. You can join us in class today. And um, we also have archive sessions that you can go back and watch also. So I want to pull up the PowerPoint presentation here. This is a crucial, crucial period of history. All right. And I created this class because I, I teach a um, online course also that deals with history uh, from ancient Africa through uh, the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors through uh, the um, Civil War. OK, through, through slavery in the Civil War. OK. And that class is uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Many of you have heard me talk about that class. We do with thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. And that class is 10 weeks. And I never had enough time to deal with the period from 1865 through 1968 the way I wanted to. This is a crucial, crucial period of history. OK, uh, and it deals with what happened to us after the after slavery ended. What were the laws and policies put in place to put us in the predicament that we're in right now? So we understand where we need to go from here, understanding how politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power and resources and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments and treaties, their adoption, interpretation and enforcement. Understanding how all this comes together to put us in a predicament we're in today. So we understand where we need to go from here. OK, so this is what this 10 week online course does. So we we uh, we lead, we deal with uh, the last year of the Civil War, 1865, and we deal with deal with what led up to the Civil War taking place as well to give a recap of that history. OK, everybody share this broadcast on you know, social media platforms. Invite your friends to uh, tune in as well. OK, so. Uh, we know the u.s civil wars 1861 to 1865 and these are some of the actual slides from the course okay i do a powerpoint presentation we have video clips articles book references etc um and it, the civil war in the united states began in 1861 it starts april 12 1861 with the attack on fort sumter in south carolina uh, after decades of simmering tensions between northern and southern states over slavery states rights and westward expansion, the election of Abraham Lincoln in, in November 1860, when he became president-elect of the Republican Party, uh, the Confederate States of America, uh, uh, Lincoln's election caused seven Southern states to secede from the Union uh, to form the Confederate States of America. Four more states are going to join them in 1861. South Carolina was the first state to secede from the Union December 20th, 1860. Now, the war between the states as the Civil War was also known, ended in uh, Confederate surrender in 1865. General Robert E. Lee surrenders uh, April 9th, 1865. The conflict was the costliest and deadliest war ever fought on American soil, with some 620,000 of uh, 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 soldiers dying of the 2.4 million soldiers uh, who, who served, 620,000 approximately going to die. We know it was about 186,000, 200,000 African Americans that served in the Civil War as well. Millions more were injured and much of the South was left in ruin. OK, so the, the, the fights that we are dealing with today, the fights over the uh, critical race theory, 
okay? The fights over uh, many of these Southern states passing laws that, that have Republican uh, uh, dominated state legislatures passing laws, not just to suppress the African-American vote and Latino vote and, and, African, and Asian-American vote, things like this. We're dealing with a little more than 400 laws and 49 state legislatures being pushed. Uh, you have um, uh, about 18, you about have about, uh, I think it's 18 states that have passed about 30 laws so far. That's the legacy of slavery. We deal with that in the class. Mississippi State uh, uh, Convention in 1890, Louisiana State Constitution in 1898, Texas State Constitution, 1876, targeting African Americans to suppress the vote. But also, this whole lost cause myth that was pushed after the Civil War ended that the, the uh, South seceded from the Union to preserve states' rights, and they were against uh, the federal government, and it wasn't about slavery and things like this, okay? We see a fight taking place today that is a legacy of what happened after slavery ended, after Reconstruction ended in 1877. And you have Republican-dominated state legislatures that are trying to suppress, especially the African-American vote, and control, and control more who can vote, suppress our vote to determine the trajectory of the future, okay? and determine who's in power to write laws and policies, et cetera. But then also they're trying to restrict what can be taught about the history of this country, what can be taught about the history of slavery as well. Whoever controls the teaching of the past will control the trajectory of the future. In these fights that we see taking place today, the January 6th insurrection, OK, the January 6th insurrection, I would argue, is a continuation of the Civil War. That's a that's a continuation of the Civil War. That's a continuation of, of, of racial violence surrounding politics, surrounding uh, political elections like the Okoy massacre of 1920 in Okoy, Florida. OK, all this is a continuation of this. So we really have to understand this history A people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. So we have to understand this history in the past, what happened to us, the attacks that were happening, the, the methods that were used to understand what's taking place today. To, to, so we better understand where we need to go from here. And all this deals with politics, laws and policies, et cetera. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power and resources and the writing of law, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. And we have to understand racism. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race, which comes out of the ideology of European white supremacy. Racism has nothing to do with not liking people, calling people racial epithets. And when you hear, when, when we see the effort to take over local school boards, you have white Republicans. There's a, there's a whole effort to fund white Republicans taking over local school boards to suppress the teaching of history and what can be taught about history in these schools, to perpetuate the ignorance, to perpetuate the ignorance. And all this is surrounding the fear of the browning of America. All this is surrounding things like the uh, census report that came out a few weeks ago that showed white people have a negative, uh, uh, a negative population growth in this country for the first time since 1790 when the first when the first census was taken okay all this is coming to a head these these demographic trends that we we've been talking about for years we're seeing all this come to a head right now all right okay so and and, and on my show the african history network show you know we've been talking about the uh uh the, the census results etc uh there was a, a article from uh washington post that uh, also dealt with the um, uh, census results, which is extremely, extremely important. Um, white people had a uh, lost uh, like about five million of uh, when it came to the population count. And uh, let me see if we could find that here. Uh, let me just pull that up to show it to you because it, it um, tells you a lot about what's taking place right now 
okay? It, it, it has a lot to do with what's taking place right now. This, uh, this article right here. Census data shows, let me pull this up. Census data shows widening diversity, number of white people falls for first time. Census data shows widening diversity, number of white people falls for first time. Okay. The report marks the first time the absolute number of people who identify as white also has shrunk since a, since a census started being taken in 1790. The number of people identifying as non-Hispanic white and no other race dropped by 5.1 million people to 191.7 million people, a decrease of 2.6 percent okay this is the first time the population of white people in this country dropped below 60 percent it dropped down to 57 percent okay it dropped from 63.7 percent in the 2020 census the 57.8 percent in the uh, in, in the 2010 census 63.7 percent it dropped to 57.8 percent in the 2020 census okay this this right here is scaring a whole lot of people this right here is scaring a whole lot of people. So now you, you, you're seeing, they knew these trends were coming, but now you're seeing the intensification of suppressing the uh, uh, votes of non-white people, especially, especially African-Americans. All right. Now, when we look at reconstruction, so reconstruction is 1865 to 1877. Reconstruction is going to end because of the compromise of 1877, which was the result of the 1876 presidential election between Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican, and Samuel J. Tilden, the Democrat. All right. And Reconstruction ends. And uh, there's a it was a secret uh, backdoor deal made between supporters of Rutherford B. Hayes and those of Samuel J. Tilden. Uh, neither one had enough electoral college votes to become president. So the Republicans say if you let Samuel J. Tilden become president, he'll remove the rest of the Union troops out of the South. And the Union troops were protecting the rights to a certain extent of African-Americans, other former slaves. Democrats agree to this. Samuel J. Uh, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes becomes president. He removes the rest of the Union troops. This allows the Southern segregationist Democrats to take back full control of state legislatures, et cetera, and to really impose the full impact of Jim Crow laws. All right. And we're going to see this stuff go downhill. Uh, and we're going to uh, see the Mississippi State Con uh, State Convention of 1890, which in in implements um, is going to implement uh, Jim um, poll taxes and literacy tests in Mississippi to suppress the African-American vote. And at this time in Mississippi in 1890, African-Americans made up the majority of the population of Mississippi. We're going to see that it's called the Mississippi plan. It's going to be adopted by other southern states, South Carolina, Alabama, Louisiana. In South Carolina, the majority of the state legislature during Reconstruction were African-Americans because we were electing them in the office. We're going to see a reversal of this. We're going to during Reconstruction, we're going to elect about two thousand African American elected officials, largely in the South. We're going to see all this reversed. The attack on January sixth is a continuation of not just the Civil War, but the end of Reconstruction and what happened after Reconstruction. So when we go through and study this history. We're going to see an attack not just on African-Americans economic progress, but African-Americans political progress. And this is a, and what we're seeing right now is a continuation of that. This is an example of how elections have consequences. When we look at Reconstruction. 1865 to 1877, for a 14 year period, the U.S. government took steps to try and integrate the nation's newly freed african-american population into society between 1863 and 1877 the u.s government undertook the task of integrating nearly four million formerly enslaved people into society after the civil war bitterly divided the country over the issue of slavery a white slave holding south that had built its economy and culture on slave labor and now forced 
by its defeat in the Civil War. They claim 620,000 lives. They're forced to change their economic, political, and social relations with African Americans. The, we, we talk about the Freedmen's Bureau, okay? The Bureau of Freedmen, the U.S. Bureau of Freedmen, refugees in abandoned lands, which is to a certain extent helping African Americans and poor destitute white people. It's helping them negotiate labor contracts after the Civil War ends. Is it is, is helping them find lost loved ones because we're trying to see we valued family, we valued marriage. One of the things that the Freedmen's Bureau is doing is helping us find lost loved ones and, and place uh ads in newspapers, and it's helping us get married legally because we had marriages on various plantations if it was allowed by the, the slave owners, but they weren't quote unquote legal marriage. So we're legally getting married. The, the, the Freedmen's Bureau is establishing uh, schools and historically black colleges and universities, things like this. OK, then you have the Freedmen's Bank as well. All right. The Freedmen's Bank is going to collapse in basically 1874. Two million dollars in deposits that we had are going to be lost. All right. All this history takes place after slavery ends. So. Uh, so we have reconstruction, we have reconstruction ending, which is really going to set uh, African-Americans back. Uh, let's, let's continue here. So we talk about special field order number 15, 40 acres in a mule. Everybody likes to talk about 40 acres in a mule. Very few people have actually like studied it, what it actually is. OK, and those who just joined us, I'm doing a brief preview of a 10 week online course that I teach on Saturdays called from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power, 1865 to 1968. Okay. We deal with history, this crucial period of history, uh, after the civil war ends. And we look at how we got, what, what, what happened to us after slavery ended. All right. And, and, and chattel slavery was not that long ago when it ends, uh, with 13th Amendment, December 1865, okay? It's not that long ago. Um, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Scroll down the page. Uh, we have the information there for the, for the course. Don't worry about the, the date, but, but uh, scroll down. Uh, click on Register Here. It takes you to the next page, and on the next page, you can register for the class. Now, we have bonus content. As soon as you register, you can like watch the class we did last week. Uh, click on enroll on the next page. The class is regularly $130 is on sale $80. We do the classes live. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch them over and over again. We have a live text chat. You can ask questions in class. You can see me. I can't see you. So it's not like Zoom. You don't have to worry. You can be in your pajamas or what have you. You can see me. I can't see you. Um, and then all the sessions are recorded. So even after this 10 week online course is over with, like next year, you can go back and you can watch the full 10 weeks. You can also use this with your children. I would say the content is PG 13. I'm not crazy. I don't do a lot of cursing and it's not vulgar, things like that. Okay. So I would say it's PG 13. Uh, we just posted the link here. Uh, so you can register, you can join us in class today. Today class is gonna start uh, about 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Normally, it's uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All right. As a special bonus, you will get uh, in digital download format when you register. You'll get the uh, two and a half hour lecture that I did dealing with the history of Juneteenth. I did that February. I did that uh, uh, June 16th, 2021. It's a two and a half hour lecture I did dealing with the history of Juneteenth. You'll get that also. And uh, as a special bonus, there's a, a, a six title uh, bundle pack that you'll also get black migration 1619 to 2019 black migration 1619 to 2019 is it includes six of my lectures this is going to be in digital download format uh you'll get that also as a special bonus so this is like a uh about a 200 value that you get for uh, 80 dollars and these are the titles we also have it on our website if you want to order it separately my um uh, six dvd uh six lecture series uh, black migrations okay and we deal with ancient african history we deal with the great migration 1915 and 1970 we deal with uh when black men dominated horse racing and how we were dominated horse racing when the kentucky derbies and got pushed out of uh horse racing uh this is oliver lewis right here he won the first kentucky derby in 75 he was 19 years
years old, African-American man. These are all uh, winners of the Kentucky Derby. Jimmy Wink Wingfield won the last. He was the last African-American to win the Kentucky Derby. He won in 1902. Uh, you get six principles of post-self-defense, uh, the history of why we switched from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. You get all that in this bundle pack. But this is going to be a bonus that you get when you register for uh, this online course also. OK, this is a special bonus from me to you. All right, uh, let's continue here. How's everybody doing? If you have any questions, go ahead and ask them how you all like this type of information. OK, uh, we have uh, Carl Jervy, uh May, just a few of the people watching, Lindale. OK, let's go back to this here. OK, so special field order number 15. We go through and break down what that was. There's a lot of misconceptions about this. OK, this did not apply to all former slaves. Uh, this only applied to uh, coastal land in South Carolina, Florida and Georgia coastal land in South Carolina, Florida, and Georgia. Most of this land is going to be taken back. You had about 400,000 acres of confiscated land confiscated from uh, Southerners and Southern plantation owners and slave owners. It's going to be divided up by among uh, uh, 40,000 African-American families. Okay. Most of that land is going to be taken back by President uh, Andrew Johnson, who succeeded Lincoln. He was Lincoln's vice president. And he was sympathetic to the South. Okay. Um, sympathetic to the south and to the slave uh, to the slave owners uh, as well um these rumors rested on solid foundations abolitionists had discussed land redistribution at the beginning of the war and in 1863 president abraham lincoln ordered 20,000 uh acres of land confiscated in south carolina sold to freedmen in 20 acre plots secretary of the treasury salmon chase expanded the offering to 40 acres per family and it's in, going to end up going to about 40,000 African-American families. What's interesting when you research this and we take you through special field order number 15. What's interesting is that that land that we got in those three states, it was only supposed to be inhabited by African-Americans, that land. And we were supposed to govern ourselves. It was it was designed to be really a nation within the nation when you actually read special field order number 15. OK, when you actually read it. Contrary to popular belief, it was not designed because a lot of people who advocate for reparations say, oh, they promised us 40 acres in the mule, et cetera. The land, first of all, the mule came later and the, and the mule is supposed to be loaned to us. It wasn't going to be given to us. It's supposed to be loaned. One, two. The land was not compensation for work that we did previously as slaves. Our ancestors did, not us, but our ancestors. We weren't there. All the former slaves, all the former slaves died in the 1950s. Okay. This is one of the challenges with actually getting reparations because a lot of the strategies we're using ain't going to get us anything except, well, a lot of the strategies that we're using, one, are not legal strategies. Two, is, is not going to bring about comprehensive reparations which means repairing the damage repairing the damage of slavery and the legacy of slavery jim crow segregation etc when we go through this class you'll see what i'm talking about okay that's a that's a whole nother conversation um but anyway i don't want to get sidetracked with that um general general william tecumseh sherman General William T. Sherman. January 16, 1865, issued special field order number 15, which redistributed roughly 400,000 acres of confiscated land in Low Country, Georgia, and South Carolina, but it was also Florida as well. When the Freedmen's Bureau was established in March 1865, created partly to redistribute confiscated land from Southern whites, it gave legal title for 40 acre plots to African Americans and, and white Southern un unionists, white Southern unionists. OK, so this land is largely going to be taken back by uh, uh, Andrew Johnson. After the war was over, President Andrew Johnson returned most of the land to the former white slave owners. At its peak during Reconstruction, the Freedmen's Bureau had 900 agents scattered across 11 southern states, handling everything from labor disputes to distributing clothing and food to starting schools to protecting freedmen from the Ku Klux Klan. I would argue when we go study this history, I would argue 
and I've, we, we have never really we have never really recovered from the from the collapse of the Freedmen's Bureau, the collapse of the Freedmen's Bank. But then also you tie to this. The Kerner Commission report from March 1868, I'm mean, sorry, March 1968, wrong century. Kerner Commission report from March 1968, because this is something we talk about in the class. When you go study the Kerner Commission report. And um, uh, the Kerner Commission report was commissioned by President Lyndon Johnson in uh, 1967. It was like July, uh, June, July 1967 to study the rebellions or what white people call riots. The rebellions that were taking place in this country from 1964 to 1967, the rebellions that African-Americans are having all across this country. When you go study the recommendations, when you go study what this commission came up with. They talked about the role that white supremacy and racism played. They talked about the role that oppression of African-Americans being locked out of job opportunities, uh, poor housing, uh, poor funding for school. All this took place and they made recommendations. Check this out. The recommendations that they made were largely ignored by President Johnson. Their recommendations were on point. When you go study what they say, it, it sounds similar to reparations. OK, now they weren't saying give a you just give everybody a check and everything's going to be all right. That's one of the problems. That's one of the problems with people who who think that repairing the damage of slavery just means a check. You're not addressing the structural inequities and the laws and policies put in place that mal distributed wealth, power and resources into the hands of white people into the hands of Europeans. If you just if you think repairing the damage of slavery means just giving a check, that means you haven't done a systems analysis of the damage that was done by slavery and the legacy of slavery. One, two, you're under the misconception that just by giving a check that somehow that's going to level the playing field. No, it's not because the laws and policies will still be in place. And they're still inflicting damage today. They are a legacy of slavery and you haven't repaired that. I'm not against cash payments but cash payments can be one part of a comprehensive reparations package but just cash payments alone is not going to repair the damage and i guarantee you whatever amount that we get if we get a half million dollars million dollars whatever whatever amount we get white people have it all back by this time next week and you would not have repaired the damage and you haven't done anything about the laws and policies that are still in place that are still inflicting harm upon us one of the things that is important for people to do is look at the study, look at the study from Citigroup Bank. OK, look at the study from Citigroup Bank. Now, I'm going to pull this up, but um, this deals with how racism has cost the U.S. economy at least 16 trillion dollars over a 20 year period of time from 2000 to 2020. Basically, just that just that 20 year period of time racism and they talk about laws and policies has cost the u.s economy 16 trillion dollars okay before we go to that let, let me just hit this done with the current commission right quick president johnson was distracted from really dealing with the results of the current commission okay some of the results he disagreed with but he was preoccupied with the vietnam war he was preoccupied with the Vietnam War. There's a there's an interview, a 26 minute, a 26 minute interview that NBC News did with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in uh, March of 1967. OK, March or, or, or May, I think it was May 1967. It was 11 months before he was assassinated. OK. That everybody, I've played this interview on my on my radio show a number of times, the African History Network show. One of the things he talks about in this interview is uh, how the Vietnam War has taken up a lot of media attention and a lot of Americans' attention away from the civil rights movement. And he said it makes it harder for us to get our issues addressed. 
Johnson was pre President uh, Lyndon Johnson, not Andrew Johnson, President Lyndon Johnson, Lyndon Baines, Baines Johnson, was preoccupied with the Vietnam War. And that was taking a lot of attention away from the civil rights movement and the plight of African Americans. So the Kerner Commission report gets pushed on the back burner. In this interview, in this in this interview is uh, before the Kerner Commission report comes out. Dr. King, and I'll give you the name of it. I think it's called from um, uh, from Civil Rights to Black Power, something like that. I forgot the exact name of it. Um, let me pull this up here. Hit this second. This is from it's like uh, civil rights to my uh, public. I'll pull it up. But Dr. King talks about um, how at the newspapers, newspapers back at that time, on the front page of the newspapers every day is information stories about the Vietnam War, and information dealing with the civil rights movement gets pushed back on page 16 or something like that okay and he talks about how it's harder to get our issues dealt with and to, and to push our agenda etc so um and some of that talk is taking place right now when we deal with the end of the afghanistan war the 20-year afghanistan war and like $2.2 trillion at least have been spent over 20 years. And you got a lot of African-Americans saying, well, wait a second, that's some, maybe not all of that money, but a portion of that money could have gone to not just paying reparations, or even if you don't want to call it reparations, restitution, but investing in communities where we live, okay? To rebuild those communities, okay? This is the talk that's taking place right now. They said, wait a second, you spent all that money in Afghanistan, okay? That money could have gone to help right here in this country. Uh, let me see here. That was... Uh, okay. Oh, you see some of these same conversations taking place. But we have to draw the connection between them and not make the same mistakes. All right, let me try to pull up. Uh, it was 1967. Here's the, uh, here's the clip from NBC News. We'll post this clip. Name of it is called uh, 11 months before his assassination, Martin Luther King talks new phase of civil rights struggle he talks about the black power movement okay this is from nbc news they have the full they have the full interview here watch that i played it a number of times on my show It's deep okay this right here from nbc news is a 26 minute interview they did in 1967 at uh ebenezer baptist church all right uh nbc news uh, reporter Sandy uh, Vanneker, Sandy Vanneker, uh, spoke with Dr. King about the new phase of the civil rights movement. All right, let's continue here. So all this history is connected. All right, and 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 you know, it's. African history and culture that gives us our foundation. This gives us our values, our interests, and our principles. This gives us a cultural paradigm that we see reality through. And uh, it's our history and culture that also influences our economic empowerment and political empowerment as well. All this is connected. Okay. So if you like this type of information, uh, you can register for this 10 week online course that I teach on Saturdays. Normally it's 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, today we're going to start a little later and this is from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 okay and we deal with this history after the civil war ended 
uh you're going to get some bonus content you're going to get some extras as well some bonus lectures from me also one dealing with the history of juneteenth uh and then the six uh title bundle pack black migration 1619 to 2019. Uh, we just post a link here, but you can also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Scroll down the home page, click on register here, and it takes you to the next page. And uh, just click on enroll. Class is regularly $130 on sale, $80. As soon as you uh, register, you can start watching the content. You can join us in class, uh, in today's class also. Okay, click right here on enroll. And this information is going to blow you away um let's see lastly um okay let's see all right uh so we deal with juneteenth all right and why the emancipation did not free the enslaved africans we deal with juneteenth and what that really was and misunderstandings about juneteenth also i'm for celebrating juneteenth and commemorating juneteenth but we have to get the history correct and we have to deal with the history of slavery, the history of the Civil War, uh, the history of Juneteenth as well. June 19th, 1865, uh, Major General Gordon Granger delivers General Order Number no. 3 in Galveston, Texas. But that was not the end of slavery in this country because you're going to have some slave owners in Texas who keep that information away from their slaves, okay, uh, and, is, and, and keep them enslaved, okay? so it's there's a debate over did all the slave owners did, did there's a debate over did the slave owners know that the slaves were free okay yeah they probably did they just kept them uh they, they, they just kept the information away from the slave many of the slaves and kept them in bondage until the following year all right and then we also have to understand that Texas was more far removed from battles during the Civil War. So you had uh, slave owners who would flee from surrounding southern states and flee into Texas with their slaves, okay, to escape from a lot of the battles in the Civil War as well, all right? The other thing that's important to understand, and we look at what's taking place in Texas right now, okay, uh, the voter suppression bill, uh the uh, attacks on what can be taught in school uh dealing with the history of slavery etc well understanding history uh, understanding history of texas and texas coming into the into the union in 1845 as a slave holding state i can see why a lot of these white republicans in texas don't want the truth taught i can see why when you study the history of texas okay and texas was mexican territory all right and the u.s wanted that territory because see this gets into a whole of uh, uh, europeans want to take over the entire north american continent and manifest destiny in 1845 and, and many europeans thinking that you know it's that god-given right really to, to take over uh the north american continent all right they already took over land from uh native americans and indigenous and african people who were already here because african people we've been in this land at least fifty one thousand seven hundred years um and when you read the first americans were africans documented evidence by dr david m hotel uh who i've interviewed a number of times and he, he speaks to my online classes sometimes dr david m hotel breaks down uh this information in uh the first americans were africans documented evidence all right so um and we we deal with that a lot in um the the other class that i teach ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school i deal with a lot of that information in that class um in, in that class as i said that deals with ancient african history through um slavery all right and um from the civil war to the civil rights movement 1865 to 1968 this 10-week course picks up basically where the first one leaves off now you can take the classes in any order that's fine and you, you still have access to the content even after the class is over with but this is a deep deep history okay if we understand that yes the transatlantic slave trade happened but african people were here for tens of thousands of years before the transatlantic slave trade happened we were here in this land okay there's an ain't there's a presence but not just from the khoisan come from southern africa the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. It's also an ancient Egyptian, ancient Kemetic uh, uh, presence here as well. 
And if we understood that, that we did not first come to this land in 1619 as the 1619 project, even though there's some good things in the 1619 project, there's some problems with it also. OK, and I know they do talk about the fact that um, the Spanish were taking Africans into Georgia and South Carolina in 1526 and enslaving them. That's 93 years before 1619. That's true. But this was our land stolen from us. This was our land stolen from us. This is something the 1619 project does not deal with. If we understood this, it would cause a overnight. It would cause a paradigm shift with African people, with African Americans, it'll cause a total paradigm shift with us. Because a lot of our understanding of history in this country deals with the oppression of African people and the dehumanization of African people. It will cause a total paradigm shift. We were here before Native Americans came into existence. The people who were called Native Americans, we were here before they came into existence. Okay. So this is this is a deep, deep history. Your thoughts create feelings. Your feelings create actions and behaviors. Your actions and behaviors create results. This is why I don't call out people the N-word. This is why I don't call out women B's and H's and thoughts and all different types of dehumanizing pejorative terms. Because I understand what happens when you put negative labels on people. You, you relabel people. Dr. Joy DeGruy talks about this in post-traumatic slave syndrome. You relabel people with negative pejorative terms to then justify their mistreatment. This is what we see taking place in slavery, which largely happens after <laughs> the, the moors lose control and th that's really to, to, to tell you the truth the transatlantic slave trade is really a continuation of the fight and the wars between the african moors and europeans in europe because they're going they europeans already knew about african people See, the the way that is taught and not when I was taking Africana studies classes. 30 years ago in um, or 25 years ago, whatever it was at Wayne State University, they start the classes in mid 15th century. OK, now I was already studying Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark and um, um, Dr. Naeem Akbar. I was already studying that Dr. Wade Nobles, things like this. They start in the mid 15th century. They skip over the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. That's why. That's why this book is so crucial. Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. That's why this book is so crucial. They skip over all that and they, they're going to deal with slavery starting with the Portuguese, like 1441. OK, 1441, 1444. The Europe. Europeans had been dealing with Africans for hundreds of years, just dealing with the Moors. Africans were already in Europe before then, but just dealing with the Moors. They had already been dealing with African people. They knew who they were. That wasn't the first time they came in contact. They knew they knew what time it was. They knew what was going on. Then this book right here by Renoko Rashidi, and we know Renoko just passed away August 2nd, 2021. He was doing a tour of Egypt and passed away from a heart attack. Black Star, the African presence of early Europe. Okay, we use these. I use these. Uh, these are two of the books I use in um, the first class, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. You can register for that class, uh, that 10 week online course at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com also. But see, this is a deep, deep history. If, if when we learn that this was our land stolen from us, we've been here for tens of thousands of years in this land that we call the United States of America. OK, that, that will cause a total paradigm shift. One, you're going to have to rewrite a lot of these history books. But that'll cause a total paradigm shift. Okay? And it, because the way we're taught, we're taught that we first came to this land conquered and shackled and changed by Europeans. If that's your premise, you already far behind. If, that, if that's your premise, you know, there's a saying, I don't know who said it, but if you think that... Um, if the majority of what you know about your history is slavery, then anything after you do after slavery will look like progress. If that's your starting point, okay, that can't be our starting point. It's not historically accurate. That can't be our starting point. All right. <laughs> okay. 
So Dennis said this will not get us reparations. What, what, what do you mean, Dennis? And what will get us reparations? Because people don't even understand. Reparations is a legal argument. When you go to elected officials, when you go to members of the House of Representatives of the U.S. Senate, based upon Article 1, Section 9, Clause 7 of the U.S. Constitution, Congress controls the power of the purse. So reparations has to pass both the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate and be signed in law by president. OK, one, two, when you go to talk about. Repairing the damage of slavery reparations, you go and make legal arguments when you go to elected officials, elected officials write laws, lawmakers write laws. They don't legislate morality, so you don't go talking about morality. We were enslaved. We didn't get paid all this stuff. We know it was wrong, but it was legal. You go and make legal arguments. The foundation of law of this country is the U.S. Constitution. So you don't go talking to lawmakers about morality. If you want to argue morality, go to church. You go and make legal arguments. One of the strongest legal arguments. Yes, the black freeman indian treaties of 1866 that's true those are treaties they should be enforced they're still on the books many of our ancestors got land like um sarah rector and i talk about sarah rector in the class okay let me wrap up with this here but i talk about sarah rector in the class um and the reason why one of the reasons why i talk about sarah rector is this ties directly into uh June, this ties directly into Black Wall Street, but this ties directly into the treaties. Okay, and the Dawes Allotment Act. We're going to talk about the Dawes Allotment Act in class today. We, we, we're going to talk about the exodus, the exodus of 1879, uh, African Americans going into Kansas, the exodus. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887. They redistributed 138 million acres of land. It was supposed to go to Native Americans and Black Indians. Two thirds of it went to white people. But how many people, are you, how many of you are familiar with Sarah Rector? This ties into the Black Freeman Indian Treaties of 1866 and the Dawes Allotment Act of 18, 1887. The, the Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians all own African slaves. How many of you all knew this? They all own African slaves. Europeans called them the, the uh, five civilized tribes of Native Americans because they adopted the way of the white man. They learned English. They became Christians. They learned to farm. They became farmers, things like this. When the Civil War happens, and I got to wrap up with this here. Also, I want to talk about Zara Cully for just a second. Uh, when the Civil War happens, they uh, fight on behalf of the Civil War. Okay, the five civilized tribes of Native Americans, they all fight on behalf of the civil, uh, uh, they all fight on behalf of the South. They all fight on behalf of the South. Okay. When they fight on behalf of the South, they don't know that that violated treaties that they had with uh, the U.S. government. Okay. Prior to the Civil War, they're going to be on um, Indian territory. They're going to have Indian territory like the um, uh, this ties into the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Okay, I'm making this too long. I'm, <laughs> I'm about to really teach a class now. <laughs> this ties into the Indian Removal Act of 1830, and the um, uh, signed by President Andrew Jackson in 1830, that pushed the five civilized tribes of Native Americans off their land in the southeastern United States, Alabama, Georgia, things like this. They go over a thousand miles. On what's known as the trail of tears and they go into oklahoma and they take their african slaves with them one third of the people who were on the trail of tears were were african people enslaved africans okay owned by the five civilized tribes native americans now some people make the argument well some of them weren't slaves; they were really servants whatever, whatever okay whatever you want to call them how, 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 whatever makes you sleep better at night all right whatever so when the civil war ends they have to give up their slaves and they're making arguments oh we're sovereign nations we don't have to buy by your laws things like this so they um they, they they enter into these treaties once again with the u.s government 
and they uh, have to give land to uh, these former slaves. Uh, they get compensation, they get uh, uh, cash payments, all types of things like this, and they get uh, membership in these Native American nations, okay? And they get basically largely put into like a protective class, so to speak. This is something Dr. Claude Anderson, one of my teachers, Dr. Claude Anderson talks about. But this ties into the uh, history of um, this ties into the history of Tulsa, Oklahoma and Black Wall Street. Why? Well, number one, Tulsa, Oklahoma was founded around 1836 by uh, Creek Indians. Right around 1836, 1834, by Creek in, by Creek Indians, who get pushed off their land in Southeast United States because of the Indian Removal Act. Now, Sarah Rector, who was known as the richest Afro American girl in the world, well, in the country, Sarah Rector, her family was of her parents had been enslaved by Creek Indians, so they had that ancestry. She's in Oklahoma. She's born on Creek Indian land. She's going to get her and her family are going to get land because of the uh, Dawes Allotment Act of 1887, which we, we, this is something we're going to talk about in the class today. OK. Um, and she's going to get a uh, hundred and you know, she, she gets uh, acres of land. They receive like 160 acres of land uh, because of the Dawes Allotment Act. Oil is going to be discovered on her land. And she's going to become a millionaire. Sarah Rector. Face to face Africa dot com has an article. We've talked about this before in, in my lecture series, Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. I talk about Sarah Rector. She's one of the people I talk about. She became a millionaire in 1913. At, at the age of 12. Okay. This ties deep into this history. Oklahoma, when we, we just had the commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa race massacre, June 1st, 1921. All this history is connected. And they talked about how a lot of the early African American landowners in Tulsa, Oklahoma got land because of the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866. And the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887. All this history is connected. When we look at this here quickly, because I want to talk about Zara Cully in just a minute. How many people know who Zara Cully is? She was born, uh, 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 Sarah Rector, born in Indian Territory, March 3rd, 1902. Okay. Her parents were owned by Creek Indians before the Civil War. And as the site U.S. Slave explains, she and some 600 other black children were entitled to land allotments as the children of enslaved people belonging to the Creek Indian Nation. Now, this is one of the reasons why Oklahoma had about 50 African-American townships. OK, we had about 50 black townships in Oklahoma because a lot of those African-American got land because of these treaties and the Dawes Allotment Act. And we rebuilt Black Wall Street after the race ride, after the, the Tulsa race massacre. We rebuilt Black Wall Street with our own dollars and we got help from surrounding black townships. We didn't get government help to rebuild. In 1886, the Creek Nation signed a treaty with the United States government promising to emancipate their 16,000 African slaves and incorporate them into their nation as citizens entitled to quote equal interest in the soil and national funds end quote two decades later the federally imposed Dawes Allotment Act of 1887 sparked the beginning of the total assimilation of the Indians of the so-called five civilized tribes of Native Americans by forcing them to live on individually owned lots and land instead of communally as they had done for centuries okay so oil is going to be discovered on her land the uh the bb uh um uh, bb jones uh the independent oil driller bb jones found a gusher on her land and 
this gusher is generating money she began receiving an income of 300 dollars per day and she became a millionaire in 1913 sarah rector okay all this history is connected And and she was in and, and, and back in 1913, they call her Afro-American because the term Afro-American dates back to the 1830s. I know a lot of people think the term Afro-American started in 1960s. No, it means you haven't studied the history that dates back to the 1830s. And you had the Afro-American newspaper found around 1882 in Baltimore. You had the uh, Afro-American League uh, uh, founded in uh, about 1898 by Bishop Alexander Walters and T. Thomas Fortune. OK the uh the afro-american league and the afro-american league of uh, that organization you had uh booker t washington in that organization you also had dr wb dubois the national afro-american league okay and out of that organization uh book uh dr wb dubois is going to leave and form the niagara movement about 1905 Okay, uh, National Afro American League, uh, 1887, 1898. Okay, read, read this uh, piece here from blackpass.org, dealing with the Nas National Afro American League. They were called Afro American. The term African American, contrary to popular belief, Jesse Jackson did not create the term African American. I don't know why people keep saying that nonsense. The term African American, uh, the earliest recorded usage goes back to um uh, may 15 1782 in philadelphia pennsylvania the term african-american that d d d look march 29 1964 in the battle of the bullet uh malcolm x used the term african-american so how the hell did jesse jackson create in 1988 1989 M malcolm x used the term african-american uh March 29, March 29, 1964, in the Ballot of the Bullet in Washington Heights, New York. Read this article here. Okay. This is from the New York Times. The term African American appears earlier than thought. This is from April 21st, 19, uh, April 21st, 2015. Uh, it appears in a book of sermons, two sermons written by the African American, one on the capture of Lord Cornwallis to be sold. Okay. Uh, we'll read this right here. Th that dates back to uh, May 15, 1782, uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That's the earliest recorded usage of the term African American. But we were calling ourselves African Americans in the 1960s. Malcolm X did that, okay, in the Battle of the Bullet. And if you read, if you read the Battle of the Bullet, even from um, April 3rd, because he delivered it three times that I know of, uh, March 29th, March 29th, 1964. This was three days after he met Dr. King. We're, we're going to break all this stuff down in the class. When we get to that, sec, those lessons in the class when we do it with the 60s. March 29th, I'm sorry, March 26th, 1964, Malcolm X meets Dr. King for the first and only time at the U.S. Senate debate for the Civil Rights Movement. The U.S. Senate debate for the civil rights movement okay for the civil rights act i should say u.s senate debate for the civil rights act so all those pictures that you see of dr king and malcolm x together that's when that picture is from okay march 26 1964. um i um i like the uh tv show godfather of harlem but their timeline of stuff is is wrong their timeline of stuff. I mean, they're showing they're showing Malcolm X with a goatee doing the Battle of the Bullet speech. Malcolm did the Battle of the Bullet before he went to Mecca. He starts wearing a goatee and facial hair while he's while he's on his hodge in Mecca, and then he wears it when he comes back. He was clean shaven when he delivered the Battle of the Bullet. The, the, the timeline of certain things is, is you know, I like the show, but the timeline is off on some, some of this stuff. But anyway, and also they didn't show where he meets Dr. King. I don't think they show where he meets Dr. King, which is which is really important to talk about. 
March 26, 1964. Now, there was uh, the, 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 the the movie that came out about 1978 made for TV called King, starring Paul Winfield as Dr. King and starring um, and starring uh, as Coretta Scott King. It was Cicely Tyson. That movie shows a fictitious sit down meeting between Dr. King and Malcolm X. One, we know it's fictitious because they ain't have a meeting that long, a sit down meeting. They only met for a couple minutes here. This is the only time they met. Two, now they were trying to meet uh, before Malcolm was assassinated. Okay. And, and Malcolm meets with Coretta Scott King uh, one time in uh, Alabama. And Dr. King is in jail. But they're trying to set up another meeting between them. If you watch the movie, um, the documentary, Make It Plain. Make It Plain is probably the best documentary dealing with Malcolm X so far. Okay, I know his daughters are putting out something. Maybe that'd be better. But so far, I've seen most of the documentaries on Malcolm. Make It Plain is probably the best so far on Malcolm. And Make It Plain has Dr. John Henrik Clark in the documentary. Dr. John Henrik Clark was good friends with Malcolm X. They talk about when Malcolm officially separates from the Nation of Islam, March 8th, 1964. There's a meeting that takes place at um, um, Juanita Poitier's house. Juanita Poitier, okay? Malcolm X is there. Different members of the civil rights move, uh, different uh, leaders of the civil rights movement are there. They can't, if they weren't there, they sent a surrogate. They had the meeting for them to put all their differences on the table so they can work together. Because when you actually go read in um, this book here, and I got to wrap things up. This book here, Malcolm X Speaks, is really important because this deals with, this has the ballad of the bullet from April 3rd, 1964. He delivered April 3rd, 1964 in Cleveland, Ohio, April 4th, 1964 in Detroit, Michigan at King Solomon Baptist Church, and then March 29th, 1964 in uh, Washington Heights, New York. Okay, the ballad of the bullet. One of the themes of the ballad of the bullet is Malcolm is talking about injecting black nationalism into the civil rights movement. Malcolm joins the civil rights movement when he officially separates from the nation of Islam. This is something that people really don't talk about. And the ideologies of Malcolm X and Dr. King are converging. Okay. This is why this is why this book here from James H. Cone is so important. Okay, Martin Malcolm in America, a Dream or a Nightmare, which shows how toward the end of both of their lives, their ideologies are converging. And they're sounding like each other. This is why it's important to read Dr. King's books. Um, where do we go from here? Is his last book uh, came out? He wrote in 1967, and I've got it here. This is this is Dr. King's first book, "Stride Towards Freedom," which is about the Montgomery bus boycott. This came out in 1958. Okay, "Stride Towards Freedom," and it was it was. Um, uh, remember 1958, that's when Dr. King was stabbed in the chest with a letter opener by Azola Ware Curry, this crazed, deranged African-American woman. He was doing a book signing for this book when uh, he was stabbed in the chest with a letter opener and almost died. So, because Dr. King wrote books, okay? A lot of people act like Dr. King ain't write books. Uh, a lot of people act like the only thing he did was deliver the I Have a Dream speech, August 28, 1963, and that wasn't even the name of the speech. It was originally called Normalcy Never Again. Then it was called a cancel check. Uh, yeah, like he did that and marched and then uh, delivered uh, I've Been to the Mountaintop. Where the hell is, uh... I don't know what my other book is. Uh, I can't find it now. Uh, where do we go from here? But anyway, that's probably his best book. That's a crucial book. Now, that was Dr. King's last book. But anyway, 
Um, when you read the Battle of the Bullet, and they have it online also, you can Google it. Uh, it's in this book also, I think. This deals with Malcolm Malcolm X's final speeches. Uh, February 1965, the final speeches. They have one from like January, but this is with his final speeches also. Okay. Uh, but one of the themes of the Battle of the Bullet is Malcolm X is talking about joining the civil rights movement and injecting black nationalism into the civil rights movement. Another thing he talks about is voting strategically and registering his independence. Okay, he talked about this also in the speech. Uh, let me see if we can pull this up here quickly. So, is that the right one? Uh, no, that's not it. That's not the one I want. Hold on, let me see. I, I, I pulled this up before. Let's look at this. Uh, but lastly, let's see here. About a little bit. I think this is it. No, it's not. Hold on, let me try to pull this up here. Um, so you can register for this 10 week online course. There's so much that we cover. Uh, I'm going to post a link again. It's also at our website, uh, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Right on the home page, click on, um, uh, you scroll down the home page, we have the information for the online course. We do the class live, all the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch it over and over again. Even after the course is over with, like next year, you still have access to the full class. You can still watch it. Okay, just click on register here. It takes you to our next page. You usually do this class on Saturdays, normally 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, today, we're going to do it a little later. And uh, when you click on register here, it takes you to the next page. Just click on enroll. Click on enroll. Course is regularly $130 on sale, $80. This bonus content you can watch. You can watch the class we did last week also. And you get some bonus lectures from me as well uh, in digital download format. Uh, let me see. Uh, you know, I think this is it right here. Okay. That's not certain. Uh, where is that? Let's see, I can't, uh, I'm trying to find it here. But also, uh, I want to talk about um, Zara Cully for a quick minute here. How many people know who Zara Cully is? Zara Cully was Mother Jefferson on the Jeffersons. Okay, Zara Cully. She was a veteran actress. This is a... Um, This is a picture of Zara Cully back in the day. You wouldn't recognize her because uh, we're so used to seeing her like his mother Jefferson. This is a picture of Zara Cully back in the day. OK. But she played Mother Jefferson on the Jeffersons. And she passed away in I think it was 1978. Here's what's so here's what's so interesting about Zara Cully. And let me try to pull this up from uh well blackden.com has uh information on zara cully hold on let's pull this up here so we've all seen uh the jeffersons we've all seen zara cully did you know that um did you know that Zara Cully was born in 1892? Mother Jefferson from the Jeffersons. Okay. Did you know she was born in 1892? Did you know that Zara Cully was born three years before Frederick Douglass died? Frederick Douglass dies in 1895. Zara Cully was born 27 years after the Civil War ended, 27 years after slavery ended. 
She was born three years before Frederick Douglass died. Okay. She dies in uh, 1978, if I remember correctly. I talked about this on my radio show. This this shows you how, like, people think slavery is ancient history. No, it's not. <laughs> she was born. Frederick Douglass was a former slave. Zara Cully was born before Frederick Douglass died. And Harriet Tubman dies in 1913. She's born before uh, Harriet Tubman dies. Booker T. Washington dies in 1915 she dies she, she she's born before booker t washington dies this piece here from um blackden.com is also uh an article on zara cully as well so when we watch the jeffersons and we see zara cully you, you're looking at a woman that that was born three years before frederick douglas died Okay, this piece right here from blackden.com uh, talks about Zara Cully. And there's also uh, this information you can Google her. Okay. But this so shows you this history is not ancient history, and we're still dealing with the we're still dealing with the after effects of the end of the Civil War, the end of slavery, uh, the end of Reconstruction. All right. We're still dealing with the after effects, after effects of that Jim Crow segregation, all of that. Born three years. Let me post this right here. Okay. Um, right, so she was born three years before Frederick Douglass died. And let me um, fix that. Let's misspelled Frederick Douglass' name. Okay, there we go. So this shows you this is not ancient history. A lot of people want to think it's ancient history, but it's not. Okay, let me see something here. Just one second, I'm trying to find something here. Okay, uh, so we'll post a link again. You can register for uh, this 10 week online course uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power 1865 to 1968. What is this here? I'm looking at this uh, from the Battle of the Bullet. And it was uh, also a good speech to read a Malcolm's is uh, his by any means necessary speech. But that is from June 28, 1964. Because he, 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 he uh, deals with the formation of the um, organization of Afro-American unity. He's announcing announcing the formation of the organization of Afro-American unity. Let's see here. A second, let me pull it. Uh, that's June 28, 1964, and they have the full speech at uh, blackpass.org. 
uh, foundation of um, formation of the organization of Afro American Unity. And in this speech here, let me see here. In this speech here, he start, he, he talks about um, a voter registration program to register people as uh, register African Americans as uh, independents, independent voters. The organization of Afro-American unity will organize the Afro-American community block by block to make the community aware of its power and its potential. We will start immediately a voter registration drive to make every unregistered voter in the Afro-American community an independent voter. OK, he said we won't organize any black man to be a Democrat or a Republican because both of them have sold us out. Both of them have sold us out. Both parties have sold us out. Both parties are racist and the Democratic Party is more racist than the Republican Party. Now, keep in mind, this is 64. The party realignment is not complete. Many of the Southern segregationists, uh, Democrats, lead the Democratic Party. And where did they go? They go to the Republican Party. This is this is before the party realignment is taking place, which dates back to 1928 and the Lily White movement in 1928. But it's not complete yet. When he says this, a lot of Southern segregation is Democrats like Strom Thurmond. They're going to leave the Republican Party and the, I'm sorry, they're going to leave the Democratic Party and they go to the Republican Party. So you're going to have a flip. It wasn't just African-Americans who were leaving one party and go to the other is white people that were doing it also. Okay, so read the rest of this uh, as well. But this is June 28th, 1964. And he talks about um, uh, the, the he talks about the importance of politics and registering the vote and registering as an independent. Now, you can be Democrat, Republican, what have you. Okay, it's about the policies, not so much about the party, the political party. It's about the policies, the policies of the party. Okay, because there's some, there's some Democrats need to be bought out of office. A lot of Republicans, a lot more Republicans need to be voted out of office, but there's some Democrats need to be voted out of office because of their policies. OK, they need to be replaced by other people who are more progressive, who have better policies, who, who advocate for better policies that are more beneficial to African-Americans. So it's not about a, 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 a D or an R. It's about the policies of the people. Of the elected officials. Okay, so check that out. That is at uh, blackpass.org. 1964 Malcolm X's speech at the founding rally of the Organization of Afro American uh, Unity. That was June 28, 1964. Okay, that's at blackpass.org. All right. Um, yeah, Joe Manchin's ass need to be put out of office. Now, the problem is Joe Manchin's not up for re-election in the 2022 midterm election. Joe Manchin of West Virginia. Now, see, West Virginia is really a red state. Uh, Donald Trump won West Virginia by about 40 points in 2016 and 2020. Joe, Joe Manchin is a conservative Democrat because liberal is not synonymous with Democrat. You can be a conservative Democrat. You can be a moderate Republican. You can be a liberal independent. Liberal is not synonymous with uh, uh, being a Democrat. All right. Being a conservative is not synonymous with being a Republican. So these are things that we have to understand as well. All right. OK, look, we have to get out of here. Be sure to register for this uh, 10 week online course uh, from the Civil War. How, how do you all, how do you all like this type of information? Number one, let me ask you that. How do you all like this type of information? Did you learn anything today? Uh, if you learn something today, you like this type of information, the, the actual 10-week uh, online course is going to blow you away. We do this online at our online school. Um, so visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Click on the link here. This class here, we do basically 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturdays. Today, we're going to start later. And uh, all the sessions are archived. You can go back and watch them over and over again. We just posted a link here. and You register for that. And you can register also for the other 10-week online course I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. 
All right, look, we have to get out of here. Um, and if you want to support the African History Network beyond registering for the course, you can do so through Cash App and PayPal. PayPal, uh, Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. And through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Um, and this helps support the radio show. We're on six days a week. And just so people know, I don't get paid to do, I'm, I do radio six days a week. Um, I don't get paid to do radio, but all this helps support uh, the African History Network, helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. This is our official Cash App account, dollar sign, the AHN show, S H O W. And uh, these other ones are fake African History Network Cash App accounts. When you go to ours, it'll say Michael and show my picture there. Our Cash App tag is dollar sign the AHN show, S H O W. So if you type it in, be sure you type in the full tag and it'll take you to our Cash App account. Uh, and then also you can support us through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, S H O W, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. All right. Look, I have to get out of here. I have to teach this class. Uh, you can join us. Uh, you can register. We'll post a link here. You can register here right now and join us in class and then also watch the bonus content. Remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Thanks for tuning in today. Hopefully you learned something. Uh, we, focus, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.